We also want and expect some simple things that probably showed up in your imagination of a perfect place. Things like clean water and fresh air, for example. And we all probably want to ensure that that perfect place, wherever it is, remains our perfect place, and that perhaps it becomes a perfect place for someone else someday, maybe our children or our grandchildren. And I think it's here where we find those tensions that the world is increasingly confronting. Our desire, our need, really, for things like heat and light and mobility is often tugging against our need for fresh air and fresh water and enduring perfect places. And of course, rightly or wrongly, these conflicting desires underpin a whole slate of geopolitical tensions in which our individual and national aspirations for those things, for our clean water and our fresh air and our heat and light and mobility, are often at odds with the aspirations of individuals and nations elsewhere who align across a wide spectrum of economic development, political philosophies, and access to resources. And recent polls today seem to suggest that many Americans are becoming more skeptical about global warming, or at least the degree to which it represents a problem requiring legislation or federal regulation to cap emissions. A growing body of scientific evidence indicates that since 1950, the world's climate has been warming, primarily as a result of emissions from the unfettered burning of fossil fuels and the raising of tropical forests. Such activity adds to the atmosphere's invisible blanket of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. That conclusion has emerged through a broad body of analysis in fields as disparate as glaciology, the study of glacial formations, and palynology, which is the study of the distribution of pollen grains in lake mud. It is based on a host of assessments by the world's leading organizations of climate and earth scientists. Despite the scientific consensus on these basic conclusions, however, enormously important details remain murky. That murkiness, of course, involves really important questions, like just how warm might it get, how quickly, how high might sea levels rise, and a very big question, are there factors that we aren't considering that might mitigate the worst of it? These are all very tough questions, and we still don't have a lot of hard answers for them. After all, if we knew, uh, for example, that Armageddon awaited us from the climate in 2020 at the stroke of midnight, unless we stopped emitting greenhouse gases, there would be a little more unanimity on how to proceed. But we're not going to have that kind of certainty. And so decisions on what to do or what not to do become matters of calculating the risk and deciding how much insurance society wants to take out on that uncertain future. Or put another way, how much is either side of the debate willing to gamble on being wrong? Meanwhile, unprecedented investment is pouring into the development of cleaner burning fuels, more energy efficient cars, renewable power sources like wind and solar, and even technologies further out on the horizon like geothermal and tidal power. These are technologies that attempt to address the tensions that I was talking about in the beginning. The tensions between our desire for heat and light and mobility, and our simultaneous desire to preserve our perfect places. And yet, even here, the trade-offs are legion. I, I would be willing to bet that very few perfect places imagined in this room included uh, several dozen wind turbines in the background. After all, even if you believe that the carbon dioxide and other gases that arise from the production and combustion of fossil fuels don't contribute to global warming, it's hard to argue that they are not polluting in other ways. Whether it's coal ash or the release of sulfur and nitrogen oxides into the air, oil spills, the leaching of drilling fluids into the water table, these are all potential byproducts of industries that we still want and need to give us our heat and our light and our mobility. How should we address these byproducts? How much are we willing to spend in doing so? Conservationists will point to New York's harbor, which is still bustling with industry and trade and commerce and bringing us our fuel and our televisions and our clothes and other things that we need as a great environmental recovery story. Seals have actually begun to return. Fishermen angle for striped bass against the backdrop of the Empire State Building. Peregrine falcons and osprey make their homes in the girding of the Verrazano Bridge. 
Even oysters are actually being slowly reintroduced, though it may be some time before you see them in a local restaurant. I definitely would not eat one. <laughs> but what's important to note is that all these changes came about as a result of local, state, and federal governments, businesses, and residents negotiating the tensions between the harbor's utility as a commercial avenue and its value as a living, breathing ecosystem. And I'd also suggest that there will really be no end to the juggling act between our use of the planet and our desire to preserve it. Whether it's putting a price on carbon or drilling for natural gas, everything involves some sort of trade-off. It seems a reasonable assumption to me that when we as a species introduce carbon dioxide in a way that would never have been there a million years ago, it's going to have some impact. And at the moment, models suggest that putting that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere has a warming effect. Beyond that, what that's going to mean, uh, does that mean sea levels are going to swallow us up? Does that mean that uh, you know, by 2020 we're all going to kind of be living in the middle of the country? I don't know. I don't have the answers to that. And I don't think science is settled on that issue either. But I think one of the problems then is, is that this particular topic does not seem to present um, and it, it wouldn't really even to the most reasonable people, although this gentleman who's a scientist can look at the models and understand it. For us as lay people, it's not a clear and present danger. And so it becomes this political football in which those on one side are trying to convince us, well, there is, you know, there is a clear and present danger, you just don't really understand how, how it works. And then there are others on the other side who say, that's nonsense. And so we get, we get bogged down in you know, a debate over, over over data that I think that the ordinary lay person couldn't understand. To my mind, what does it matter if, if, if climate change is right or wrong? There are a million other reasons for um, taking a look at fossil fuels, looking at the impact that they have on the environment, which, you know, let's remove carbon dioxide emissions. There are all kinds of other impacts that those industries have. And let's focus on that. And it would be difficult for, um, I think, now, I may be wrong, but it would be very difficult for anyone, you know, even a climate change skeptic, to say that they would prefer to have dirty water, that they would prefer to have, um, you know, particulate matter in their air. I think that these are, these are, if we can move the debate onto these topics and onto the, you know, the more immediate environment, that might be a way forward past this debate.